Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you, Lord, in spirit and truth. And Father, I just ask that by the power of your spirit, you would use your word to change us, to conform us to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, if there are people here today that don't know you, that today would be the day of their salvation. Maybe for those that have wandered from you, that have not been gripped by your grace, that today you would draw them back to you for your glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can you hear me on my mic? Oh, good. It's working now. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, I do have to say, and first of all, if you're a guest, welcome. Uh, for you regular tenders, welcome. You know, we, we, have, we have a great production team that is always working hard behind the scenes. And you never think about them unless something goes wrong. And it's like, like and then, then everybody's all upset and they're running around. And it's like, but we really appreciate our production team and how much they do. Yeah. It's, it's, like, I mean, it's kind of wrong that the only time we notice them is if something goes wrong. But... That just shows that they're doing their job, right? Um, you know, before we, before we get into our message, um, I just want to acknowledge what's going on in the Middle East right now. I sent something out this week, and, uh, you know, I felt, a I felt a little bit remiss that I didn't say anything last Sunday. Now, there were some people that didn't even know about the attack in Israel. And for me, um, you know, having grown up in the 70s, I remember 1973, uh, when Israel was attacked, and uh, you know, I uh, was pretty busy last week, and I just really didn't pay attention to the news too much. I heard that Israel was attacked, but I just didn't think much of it because they get attacked on occasion. But you know, after we have seen some of the images and the videos coming out of there, you know, I know if you're like me, your heart is broken. Your heart is broken for the Israeli people who have lost loved ones, those that have, that, that have died, those that have been taken hostage. Your, your heart is broken for the Palestinian people that don't want anything to do with Hamas and that all they care about is just living their lives peacefully. And so I think it's important that we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And one of the Psalms of Ascent, Psalm 122, says this in verse 6. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. And not, not only am I praying for physical peace, but I'm praying for spiritual peace. And that's what we all should be praying for. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, if you would, and find your way to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to grab a black Bible in front of you. You can find Paul's second letter to, the, uh, to his young, not so young anymore, uh, uh, son in the faith, Timothy, on page 935. And as I will be talking about in a minute, we open up God's word because we want to hear what God has to say to us. Well, in 2001, when Pam and I both surrendered to full-time ministry, we were in Dallas, and we had gone from being real estate developers, restaurateurs, to all of a sudden being in the ministry. And so one of the ways we, we supplemented our income is we would build a home a year. Now, one of the things that we learned about building in Dallas is there's a lot of different variations of soil in the city. In fact, they all run north to south. You have this what's called sandy loam. So if you're building on this sand... You're going to have to drive some piles deep down until you hit bedrock so that your foundation is secure. But then there was, a, there was another type of soil. It was clay. You had both gray clay and you had black clay. And in fact, they, the, the black clay they called black gumbo. Now, when it would get hot and dry, that black gumbo would dry out. It'd be like hard pan. It'd be cracks everywhere. But when it got wet... Like, if you stepped in it, you lost your shoe because your shoe wasn't coming out. I mean, it was just, it was horrific. And you, we actually had to water around our foundations just to make sure that it remained stabilized. So we knew that when we were building a house, you had to understand what kind of soil it was. And if it was black gumbo, what you had to do was stabilize it. And what we would do is we would mix that soil with lime, which is a stabilizing agent. Why? Why? Because if the foundation is right, is not right, 
the house that you build on it is going to pro- be a problem, especially in the changing seasons. Wasn't well, that true for Christians? If we don't get the foundation of our lives right, then when you have the shifting sands of the culture, the shifting sands of what's going on in the world, we could find ourselves unstable. The Apostle Paul understood the importance of a right foundation. In fact, let me put up 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says this, according to the grace of God given to me, and this is really important, the grace of God, he understood he had received God's grace. And if you don't hear anything else in this message, I pray you would hear that because that's going to be really the the underpinning for all of our application. He says, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our foundation. He's our firm foundation. He is the cornerstone. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, let's keep going, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. Notice the day is capitalized. That's the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord. Because it will be revealed by fire. God will, it's like he takes a blowtorch to what we have built. And if it's wood, hay, and stubble, it burns up. It will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. The key to all of this is the foundation. That we would have a firm foundation. Paul is reminding Timothy of what can undermine the foundation in this passage before us. Now let me just put up the big idea of the message, and that's this. Correctly handling God's word is the foundation for our stability in an unstable world. Correctly handling God's word. And it's not only handling God's word, it's understanding God's word. And who is the focus of God's word? It is Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Correctly handling God's word is the foundation for our our stability in an unstable world. Are you feeling unstable? It may be because you're not building your, your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 14. Paul says this. Speaking to Timothy, remind them of these things, we'll talk about that in a minute, and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity." Correctly handling God's word is a foundation for stability in an unstable world. So how do we stabilize our lives? Let's look at this. Your life stabilizes you when you abstain from quarreling. When you abstain from quarreling. Now look again at verse 14. He says, remind them of these things. Now Paul goes from you, Timothy, you see it all through the first two chapters, to now he says, remind them. Who's them? Well, he's talking about his church. He's talking about the church in Ephesus where he is a pastor. He says, remind them of these things. What things? All that we've been talking about. Remind them to be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Remind them to teach the truth and pass them on to others. Remind them, as a good soldier, don't get entangled in civilian pursuits. Remind them like an athlete to compete according to the rules. Remind them that as a a farmer, you work hard. 
remind them to remember Jesus Christ, to remember the word of Christ, to remember that your suffering is not in vain, to, to, that, that God is always faithful. He says, remind them of these things. And then he says this, and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. They weren't having food fights. They were having word fights. They were quarreling about words. And, and notice it says, which does no good but only ruins the hearer. When he says charge, it's to, it's to warn, to solemnly urge. There was something serious about this. They were fighting about words. They were quarreling. They were disputing. We avoid word fights. How? By right doctrine. By right doctrine. My responsibility as a teaching pastor is to teach truth from God's word. And the more we as a body knows the truth of what God's word says, the less word fights we're going to have. Because it brings unity, unity under the truth of God's word. It brings stability. Notice Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 4. In fact, in chapter 4 verse 11, he says that, that, that God gave the prophets, the evangelists, the apostles, the shepherds, and the teachers, what? To equip the saints, that would be you all. For the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. See, it's through proper teaching of God's word, rightly handling the truth, which we're going to talk about in a minute. We all attain the unity of the faith and we all attain the knowledge of the Son of God. Who is the Son of God? He's the second person of the Trinity. To mature manhood, that's the goal. We want to get, become mature to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we may no longer be children. This is what happens when you don't have a right foundation. He uses a different metaphor here. He uses a ship without any direction. We're no longer tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up, each one of us, in every way into him, who is the head into Christ for, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint which is, with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, having a right understanding of Christ, who they're living for, understanding, using their roles, using their gifts. It makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Get the foundation right. Teach the truth. And we're not going to quarrel about words. And Paul understood this. He says, remind them of these things and charge them before God. Now, that's serious. Like, this is before God. Don't quarrel about words. There was a problem. They were quarreling. They were, they, they were struggling with words. And so often, we can find ourselves quarreling about words and building doctrines based on certain words. This is Satan's scheme, isn't it? Think about it. Back in Genesis chapter 3, Satan says, did God really say? Did, did God really say that men and women should have different roles in a marriage? Now, God didn't really say that, did he? Yes, he did. Did God really say that men and women should have different roles within the church? Yes, it, it, it's very clear. Did God really say that there's only two genders, that gender is not fluid? God said there's two genders. There, there's a man and a woman. Did God really say that marriage is between a man and a woman? Yes. But what happens is we start quarreling about words. We become unstable, and it creates ruin to the hearers. Did God really say it's so important for us to understand that God wants us to be grounded in the word of God. Not to, be, not, not to quarrel about words that might sound good in the culture, that might sound good in the changing world around us. Paul says it does no good. In fact, he says it only ruins the hearers. That word ruin, it's catastrophe. What does that sound like? 
catastrophe. It's catastrophic. It could be catastrophic. It's like the ruins of a building after an earthquake. It just crumbles. The foundation wasn't right. It wasn't built right. We have to be so careful. The spiritual health of the Ephesian church was being threatened. Timothy, remind the church of what I've told you. Charge them in the presence of God, presence of God not to quarrel about words. Why? Because the Lord is watching. If you're new to hope, welcome. But we would love you to be a part of our church. But if not, here's what's important. If this is not the right church for you, which I couldn't understand why it wouldn't be, but if it's not the right church for you, find a church that's going to systematically preach the word of God, that is going to teach the truth, that is going to teach the whole counsel of God, like if, uh, Acts chapter 20 tells us. That way you make sure that you're not quarreling about words. So your life stabilizes when you abstain from quarreling about words. But secondly, Paul tells Timothy, your life stabilizes when you correctly handle God's word. When you correctly handle God's word. Look at verse 15. He says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. A firm foundation and the house that is built on it is sound when you correctly handle God's word. Let me say this. The greatest antidote to false teaching is right teaching. I mean, that's not necessarily a brilliant statement. But it's truth. We fight false teaching with the teaching of God's word. With the clarity of God's word. Paul says this. He says, do your best. It's the idea of working hard to be eager. It's an intensive desire. Make every effort. Do your best to teach rightly. And the way we do that is we want to know the truth. Back in 1865, right after the Civil War, the thing that was getting ready to undermine the whole nation was the amount of counterfeiting that was being done. So, so at that time, the United States Treasury Department formed the Secret Service. A lot of people don't know that the Secret Service's main priority was to deal with counterfeit money. And the way they would train their agents is not to teach them what was wrong or, or, or about counterfeit, they taught them to identify the real thing. They would study intently the truth. They didn't focus on all this other stuff. They focused on learning what real money looked like. And that's the same thing for us. He says, he says here in verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be shamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We don't want to be shamed when we stand before the good Lord. We want to be able to rightly handle the word of truth. Now, let me just ask you this. Think about something you have worked really hard at in your life that you've become really good at. You've excelled at it. You're not ashamed of it because you know you've spent a lot of time getting really good at it. Let me ask you, can you say the same thing about handling the word of God? Do your best to bring yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, if you're sitting there and feeling convicted by that, I'm going to give you a warning. Don't write down on a list saying, I got to be better at handling the word of God. I, I, I got I to do this to-do list. I'm going I'm to put all these things in place. Because what's going to happen is a year from now, you're going to find that you're no better off. What you need to focus on is the one who saved you, the gospel, the fact that Jesus died on the cross in your place. Let your mind be so overwhelmed by that, that you want to know the word of God because it teaches you about the God of the word. See, when you make it just a list of to-dos, then at some point you're going to get tired. 
But when you're so motivated from the inside, of, I want to know this God who has saved me, that laid his life down for me, that has allowed me to, to, to spend eternity in heaven, that then becomes a motivation from the inside out. It no longer is this legalistic to-do list, but it's like it's so gospel-empowered that, man, you want to be a worker who rightly handles the word of truth. He says, do your best. Present yourself to God as one approved, a worker not ashamed. See, he creates this progression. Like, I want to do my best. and I want to present myself, God, as one approved. I want to be a worker. I, want, I don't want to be ashamed that we would rightly handle the word of truth. That rightly handling the word of truth, it means to cut straight. It's the idea of, of how I would use a sword. Or it's a word that's used when you're plowing a field. You, you, know, you don't want your, your plow to go all over the place. You want straight lines. I, I love growing up in the Midwest in Indiana. You know, once the fields were all plowed, once they were, they were plowed and they were planted and, the, and the, the corn started to come up and you just see these straight rows. We're called to cut straight. It's the idea of teaching faithfully and living it out practically, rightly handling the word of truth. And we know that we're called to be not only hearers of God's word, but doers of God's word. We rightly handle it, not just so we can be Bible bubbleheads, but that we can live it out. See, God's word, it washes us, it purifies our souls, it keeps us from sin, it nourishes us. See, our firm foundation is founded on the truth of God's word, and all other thinking is, is sinking sand. Paul is telling Timothy, listen, you and teach your church to rightly handle the word of truth. This will keep you stable in an unstable world. Here's the challenge. We have to be careful of compromise. We have to be careful of poor handling of God's word. How many churches have declined? Or how many churches have closed down? Because they've forsaken this teaching. Pam and I live around the corner from a church that have these rainbow colored doors. And on those doors it says, our doors are open to everyone. And we mean everyone. Our doors are open to everyone. And we mean everyone. So what's the difference? Well, we know something about that church. They don't teach the clear teaching of God's word. See, here, we are going to open up God's word and we're going to teach what God's word says. And what will happen is God's word will confront sin. It does. It confronts sin. And, and so in that church, they don't teach the word of God because they know the word of God will confront people in their sin, and so as a result, they feel comfortable in their sin. We don't want people to feel comfortable in their sin. We want the Holy Spirit to work in their hearts so they see God for who he is and what he's done for them, that they want to flee from their sin. Our doors are open to everyone, but we're going to speak the truth of God's word. God's truth will confront their sin. It won't condone their sin. I, when Pam and I first moved to, to Phoenix in 2008, we planted our other church. We lived across the street from this couple that were living together. They weren't married. And we, we became friends with them. We really liked them. We would hang out with them. I mean, our goal was always to try to get them to church. And, and, and they would never come. And, and I remember one morning, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to, I'm going to teach Ephesians chapter, I think it's, it was Ephesians chapter 5, but it was, it was on marriage, and it, I was dealing with fornication and premarital sex, and all of a sudden I get a text that they're going to come join us at church that day. <laughs> of all the days. I mean, like, of all the days. In my flesh, guess what I wanted to do? I got to come up with another text. But 
that would have been compromise. That, that, that would have been conforming to what the culture says. So they came and they heard the message. And actually, went over the, we went over that, last, that, that night, and guess what he said to us? I, he goes, I guess we either need to get married or move apart. That was the Holy Spirit. That wasn't us. And that's why Paul says, teach, he says, rightly handle the word of truth. Our doors are open to everyone. But if somebody comes in here and they have a same-sex attraction, the word of God will encourage them not to give in to temptation. The attraction is not sin. It's giving in to the temptation. If somebody is tempted into premarital sex, the word will encourage them not to give in to temptation. If someone is struggling to love their spouses as they're called to in God's word and they want to leave them, the word of God is going to is going to challenge them not to give in to that temptation. If someone is, came in these doors living a homosexual lifestyle, which we've had, we're going to love them. But we're going to love them enough to speak the truth. And, and the truth is, they need to be saved. They, listen, we don't want to just impose our thinking on unsaved people because unsaved people are unsaved people. What we want them to do is understand the grace of God and let the Holy Spirit in them change them and change their thinking. Pam and I were at a conference um, probably about nine or ten years ago in Louisville, Kentucky. She was getting, she had she had been working on getting her certificate. Uh, she's a certified biblical counselor, I think one of 16 in the state of Arizona. So we went there. We were at Southern Seminary, and she was getting her diploma. And, and, and you know, it was, it was not sure where the diploma is, but she, she, she uses what she learned, not the diploma. But we heard a lady speak. Her name is Rosario Butterfield. There were 1,900 pastors and leaders in this room, and you could hear a pin drop. Rosario Butterfield was head of women's studies at Syracuse University. She was a gifted speaker. She was a national speaker. And she was on the forefront of LGBTQ, QT, whatever, thinking. She was a committed lesbian. And she had written a letter to the Syracuse newspaper, and a pastor had responded. And they ended up getting into a two-year conversation. And this pastor loved her well, engaged with her, answered questions, opened up the Bible over time because she had questions. And in a two-year, over two-year period, she renounced who she was as a lesbian and realized she came to Christ, became a believer. She, today, she's married to a Presbyterian pastor, and they have six kids. It was, a, it, was, it was powerful. But here was a preacher who rightly handled the word of truth, loved her well, opened their doors, but spoke truth. Didn't compromise. If you love your kids, you're not going to let them continue to run out in the street. That is biblical love. So you, you, you keep your foundation stable by teaching the truths. It's when a church compromises biblical truths to conform to the culture, that's when you see denominational uh, splits. That's when you see church splits. See, God's truth is our firm foundation. It always will be. It, it, it's, we, I put up this verse last week, Isaiah 40, verse 8, which says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Paul knew. Paul knew as he's writing this to Timothy, he could be executed at any moment. And, and his last words to Timothy are these. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Turn to chapter 4 real quick. He, he continues this thinking on. He continues on this thinking. He says in verse chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ. Now that's a big deal. You better listen up when you get that kind of a charge. 
who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, he says, preach the word. Preach the word. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Why? Why? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Like, honey, let's go find a church that tells us what we want to hear. No. No, we want to go someplace that's going to tell us the truth. We may not like the truth, but it's not about us. It's, it's about God and living under the authority of God. They'll look for teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Destruction. Each week, we open up the Bible. We point back to the text because we want you to see where we get it. Your life stabilizes when you don't quarrel about words, when you correctly handle God's word. Third, your life stabilizes when you avoid irreverent babble. When you avoid a reverent babble, look at verse 16. I just, I got these applicational points right out of the text here. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of some. He says, avoid, keep yourself from. Avoid being involved in. Avoid what? Irreverent babble, pointless, profane, worthless, or worldly babble. This describes the empty babbling of false teachers. In fact, in the early church, false teachers were popping up everywhere. It was, you ever see that game Whack-A-Mole? It's like, you know, they, they got all these holes and the, the, the gopher or whatever comes up and you, you hit it with a hammer and it pops back down. It was just like, that was going on. And so Paul is dealing with it. I mean, like in his letters, he's playing whack-a-mole because they're popping up. And we have to be careful because the same thing happens today. They may be organized in their approach, but without substance. They don't promote the life and practice which God approves. Look at the results of irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. They're more focused about arguing about words, about irreverent babble, than understanding the truth of who God is and what he's done for us, and now, as a result, how we ought to live. So all of a sudden, they're just, they're always having these, these doctrinal differences, these theological conversations. And I love having theological conversations. But if it's the, for the point of like, I just want to be right, and I want to prove you wrong. Like, what is that? He says, avoid it. They're more concerned about arguing about words than being rocked by the sacrifice of Christ on their behalf. Beware of those that just, they babble about words, but they don't live out the truths of God's word. I mean, you can find that on the seminary campuses. You, you can find it with people that have these, these babbling wars, and they go home and they have no relationship with their spouse. What is that? They debate theology for prideful self-promotion. They have meaningless, vain discussions. Isn't it, like, don't we have enough noise in this world? Don't we have enough just stuff coming in? Like, let us be people that rightly divide the word of truth, that understand the word of truth. And see, this meaningless babble, this irreverent babble, I mean, that's just wood, hay, and stubble. God's just going to, he's going to blowtorch it. And notice the impact of it. I already said in verse 16 that it leads to more and more ungodliness but it gets worse, and their talk will spread like gangrene. 
Some translations say cancer. Gangrene is a nasty disease. It's horrific. It eats away at the flesh and the bones. It spreads from the one affected place and spreads out. That's why somebody that gets gangrene, if it's not, if it's not handled, they may have to have a body part amputated. It, it consumes neighboring parts of the body. It can be fatal. This is the description of the irreverent teaching of the false teachers. And notice he names a couple of them. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Dangerous. Two false teachers. Now, you don't hear me calling out false teachers much, but if you come to me and say, you know, I've been listening to so-and-so, what do you think of them? One, if I don't know, I'm going to go find out. But two, if they're a false teacher, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you why. Because that's important. Part of our job as pastors and elders is to protect the flock. But sadly, there's many false teachers out there, and the Internet has only boosted their ability to get their false teaching out. And just because they're a good communicator doesn't mean that they're a right teacher. Paul calls out Hymenaeus. He calls out Philetus. In fact, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 19 and 20, and then again in chapter 6, verse 20 and 21, it says, they have shipwrecked their faith. They have wandered from the truth. And Paul says that he handed them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. L look at verse 18. They have, they have swerved from the truth. It's like they're going down the road, and all of a sudden, I mean, you're, you're, you're in your lane, and then all of a sudden, boom, you, just, you drive off into the ditch, and everybody that's going with you goes off into the ditch with you. That's why Paul is saying, you've got, you've got to be careful. You've got to watch out for the irreverent babble, people that are teaching false teaching. The results can be catastrophic, can cause others to be ups upsetting the faith of some. We must protect the flock through sound teaching. Finally, your life stabilizes when you abstain from quarreling about words, when you correctly handle God's tr word, when you avoid irreverent babble, and fourth, when you stand on God's firm foundation. When you stand on God's firm foundation. Look at verse 19. He says, but God's, found, God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. And there's two things on the seal. The Lord knows who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Paul makes it clear. No matter the false teaching around you, the gospel continues to stand firm. You cannot upset the gospel. The gospel is the truth of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, that he died, that he took our place. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might receive the righteousness of God. On the third day, God raised him from the dead that, so that anyone that puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. And nothing can overturn the gospel. The gates of hell cannot overcome the church. It is built on Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. He says, but God's firm foundation stands. Jesus, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he had talked in, in, in Matthew chapter 7. He says, there, in that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, haven't we cast out demons in your name? Haven't we prophesied in your name? And he says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. Why? Because they didn't build their foundation on the rock that is Jesus Christ. He ends the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. Notice what he says. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He built his house on the rock. So who is that person? It's the person that not only hears but does the truth of God's word because they've learned to rightly handle the word of truth. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. Why? It's, it's the changing culture. It's the, 
the, the, the shifting sands of this world. There was that storm. It beat on the house. It'll beat on our house. But the house will stand if it's built on the rock. It did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. But then there's a contrast. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Do you know that ended the Sermon on the Mount? It's kind of like a mic drop. Jesus just walked off. Just for everybody to listen to the implication of that. The importance of building your house on the rock. He just told them. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Because they weren't hearers and doers. And so what he says here in verse 19, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. He says, the Lord knows who are his. What Paul is doing is he's referring back to Numbers chapter 16, the rebellion of Korah. Korah and a couple others, they thought that Moses was having a little bit too much power. And so God said, I know who are mine and I know who's not. So when there was an earthquake, it swallowed up 250 people, those who were not. Korah's rebellion. So he says here, the Lord knows who are his on the last day. He knows who are his. And so we see, how do we know? Who, how does he know? Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Oh, so if I depart from iniquity and I name the name of the Lord, that means that I'm his. Yes, but it's an inside-out transformation. In fact, you're in 2 Timothy right now. Turn just a page to the right to Titus, or two pages to the right, to Titus chapter 2. This is a really important passage. In fact, I was reading the book by J.D. Greer, Gospel, which I'm encouraging everybody to get. And he talks about this. Look at verse 11 of chapter 2 of Titus. He says, For the grace of God has appeared... The grace of God, God's grace in our lives. It has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, for all those. And then notice what it says in verse 12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Notice what it doesn't say. He doesn't say here, okay, church, you need to renounce ungodliness. You need to renounce worldly passions. You need to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. You need to step away from lawlessness and, and impurity. That's not what's training them. What's training them? It's a recognition of the gospel. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all. It is the God's grace that trains us. It's a change. It's a transformation of the heart. You see again in verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope. The appearing of, our, of, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us. Let those truths be so radically present in your lives that let that train you to renounce ungodliness, to renounce worldly passions, to desire to live a self-controlled life. It's an inside-out change. You're no longer living this, this life of legalism but you're living a gospel-empowered life. And let the gospel of Jesus Christ in your heart change you from the inside out. That's why Paul says, the, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. And they depart from iniquity because their lives have been radically impacted by Jesus Christ. As our worship team comes up, your life stabilizes when you abstain from quarreling about words, 
when you correctly handle God's truth, when you avoid irreverent babble, and when you stand on God's firm foundation, the foundation of Jesus Christ, our cornerstone, our chief cornerstone, let those truths change you from the inside out. Build your foundation on the only foundation that will stand, and that is Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word, the truth of your word, Lord. I pray for those maybe that are here today that have struggled in their walk with you. In their life, their Christianity has all been all about doing. But Lord, I pray that it would no longer be about doing, but it would be about believing. It would be about a relationship with you that so radically changes their lives that they would renounce ungodliness, they would renounce worldly passions, that they would renounce irreverent babble, they would, they would, they would avoid arguing about words, and they would just rest in your grace. Father, I pray if there's anyone here that's never received you as Lord and Savior, I pray that today they would place their life on the only foundation that stands, and that's Jesus Christ. I pray they would turn from their sin and by faith turn to you as the only hope for eternal life. They would receive you even now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can go ahead and stand as we...